That first video that we shoot in our new space sometime down the line, it, it'll be quite the shock, I imagine, like going from our homemade walk-in, which you know you can see like the the foam insulation here, which uh, is awesome for what it is, but we're definitely going to see an upgrade for all this sacrifice that we've put in this year. Although, it, wondering when the end is in sight at this point. Uh, it's, after, it's like a long packaging shift. Uh, this past Saturday, we had a, a new guy working um, and his day ended up going 15 hours uh, on his first, first like solo shift. And uh, what's interesting is only five of those hours were bake time and then 10 of those hours were packaging time. And there's actually nothing worse than packaging bread solo, especially when you have a mountain in front of you. It seems like there's just no end in sight. So it's probably the closest thing to our construction project right now where it really feels some days like there's no end in sight, uh, like we're just spinning our wheels. But we aren't. We're, every day we are getting closer and closer to the, to the finish line, albeit uncovering new obstacles along the way. Hopefully we've reached the end of the new obstacles. This is a sheet of test focaccia that's fairly cold right now and it's going to go into that other um, room which is set warm. Um, I literally forgot about this yesterday. Um, I had mixed it and moved along with my day. Um, I had to run over to the new location. I had to do a bunch of things. And then I was about to go to bed and I realized that the focaccia was still bulk fermenting, which gave it like six hours out um, yesterday. And that's not a problem with focaccia. It's literally the bread that you can almost forget about. So we're transferring it warm right now uh, and going to let it, let it do its thing. It's 80 degrees Fahrenheit in this room and humid. So I'm just putting it up on that shelf. Uh, it's really, really early in the morning right now. And the goal with this focaccia is to have it for lunch today. So. It's gonna be a little while until we um, address it. So far, I have mixed it, which I'll show you a little later on, and transferred it into a bin. And I let it be in that bin all day until I forgot about it. Um, and I gave it one fold at the end just to give it a little bit of structure. And then, we put it in the cooler overnight, um, and now I'm putting it over here. So pretty minimal effort. Uh, since it's a sourdough process, it's still extremely long. Uh, but in that case, it's kind of nice because it's not moving fast and it can kind of be happening in the background. If there is a bread that you could really easily make at home and it's very difficult to get it wrong, uh, it's focaccia. Uh, I'm making it on a pretty small scale right now. We're testing our formula because while I say that to you, I, I'm still going to try to perfect the, the most perfect focaccia for production. Uh, we don't make it right now on a regular because of our business being kind of farmer's market centric and so I think of focaccia as something that's between bread and pizza. Uh, and so the idea of serving it pretty close to straight out of the oven while it's still warm is appealing to me. It's something that we are testing now because we think it would be a really nice addition to our new space. Uh, one of the things I love about it is all the various flavors that you can incorporate even, well, in a bakery level in, 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 a, in the same batch, because you have multiple trays of focaccia, you can top them all differently if you'd like. Uh, but at home too, you can really throw anything on it. Uh, 
so long as it has some base fundamentals. So we'll get back into that a little bit later. Uh, just from a construction standpoint, uh, just as a tag along to construction updates, when we designed our walk-in and our new space, we put the door in the middle of the walk-in uh, from the lesson here. Well, here we wanted to maximize the wall space here so that we could have a workstation. So in, if we did this all over again, we probably would have to do a similar configuration anyway. Uh, but it kind of sucks to have the door to your walk-in at the side of the walk-in because if something is all the way back there, which I suspect today my croissant dough might be, I have to quite literally empty the walk-in to get to it. So let's see where we're at today. We have a rack of English muffins, which are going to be baked relatively soon uh, by one of our crew members that's coming in soon. So I'm gonna take this over to the oven room and let these get a little warm. If you go back in time into our videos that are sort of summer centric in date, you'll notice that these are up, but you probably would have noticed in recent videos uh, that these are not. Uh, about four weeks ago, we had our first close to 100 degree day here Fahrenheit. Uh, it got to like 97. It's been hitting the 90s and we're now uh, towards the end of April. Um, and typical, so last year, April 27th was the first 100 degree day. Well, this room has air conditioning. Uh, the other rooms do not. So that's a new addition that we couldn't quite refine or finish before we were asked to leave here. Uh, so we're not air conditioning that at, that, at this point. Um, but these things are basically, they're thermo panels that are designed for walk-in coolers. Uh, they come in big rolls, and so we cut them to the, the length that we needed. And we actually have them on magnets so that we can take them down and clean them. Uh, pretty strong magnets so that we can still move these around f pretty well without them falling. Uh, but it's incredible how much of a difference these make. It's 69 degrees Fahrenheit in this room, which is air conditioned, and 77 degrees in this room. And of course, it's also still nighttime. The outside temperatures are actually pretty cool this time of year. So, uh, wait until the day once it gets 90 outside it will be 90 in all the other rooms but it will still be in the 70s here and that's thanks to those uh, strips keeping the cold air since I'm unburying anyway I'll give you a preview of what we've got in the pipeline um, this is an entire rack of very closely packed together pastry uh, our chocolate croissants our plain croissants, uh, some almond croissants, some rosemary twists. Now I have a secondary speed rack and I like to work in batches when I do croissant dough. So I'm gonna pull first four of them. This is more of a pro tip and and I would do this only if you really know, know your temperatures and you know what you're doing and you have a good pace about things. Um, if you don't have really good control of temperature in your room, of the dough, of the butter, which is uh, right beside me here at room temperature. Now that we've been putting a little bit more content out on croissants, uh, I've been getting a lot of questions uh, and as much as I would love to say that sourdough croissants are for everyone to make, I would say sourdough croissants are for everyone if you're willing to put in the time to really understand. And it's not something that, that can really happen overnight. Uh, for me, the sort of baseline knowledge on sourdough croissants before we felt 
at all proficient was over a year of trial and error. Uh, and a lot of it was adapted to our, our specific situation. Uh, so that's actually the topic of, of today. Uh, you're, you're going to notice another segment a video on croissant lamination uh, where we got to test our new butter for one of the first times. It was like my second or third time working with it. And quite frankly, you know, you saw me laminating and judging the judging each one, giving myself pretty low marks uh, throughout. Um, now that we're now that a couple weeks have passed by, um, I've done a lot of legwork to refine, um, and everything I thought I knew about lamination sort of had to be adjusted for new butter. Uh, and and that, that's, I think part of the point is, this is a highly specific and technical product, and if you change one thing, it has the ability of changing everything substantially. Butter is a key ingredient in croissants uh, by volume. And so a change to butter uh, will potentially change the process significantly. Uh, that was definitely my experience. Uh, and it's, it's been beyond worth it because this butter is just significantly uh, of a, of a different caliber than the butter that we were using before. Uh, to break that down, this is an 83% butter fat butter. The uh, sort of max potential with butter is around 86. Uh, and max potential meaning, I suppose, in like a perfect environment, I haven't actually come across very many 86 butters. Uh, but the higher the fat content, the lower the moisture content, the stiffer the butter, uh, the better it holds up to heat, the richer its taste and smell. Uh, and so if you smell the block of butter versus the one that we're using before, which was uh, stated to be an 82%, it's crazy how different the two smell uh, and I guess most importantly tasting uh, the first time that we use this butter in our pastries and I tried it uh, you could immediately taste like a richer butter flavor in the in the pastries overall and it didn't take somebody that eats croissants more than I care to admit uh, to, to identify that. We've heard that from many, many of our customers now that there is a substantial difference in, in the taste. Uh, I felt like our croissants were already quite good, uh, but this butter has made them better. Before I get into this, this um, more refined lamination, I, I would like to also clarify that our croissants still had a really nice honeycomb pattern and nice results in the time that we were testing. And I think it's an important thing to highlight because at least for me, when I was first learning about croissants, I thought it was all in the lamination, that that was the end all be all to a perfect croissant. Uh, and it turns out there's a lot more to it than that, uh, like nailing the final proof as I would actually, I would probably give that the heaviest overall weight, uh, nailing the final proof and fermentation of a sourdough croissant. Uh, as far as getting a honeycomb pattern, you can have a C level lamination and still end up with pretty decent results. Although if I, if I had a C level lamination and I cracked butter every day, I'd, I would be a miserable human. Like there's something about it that's just, just, I don't know. It, it really bothers me. Uh, and it's a depressing thing to work at this station and watch butter shatter all day. Uh, so, sorry, I'm a little sore. Amanda dragged me to a personal training session the other day and 
we did like an hour of work on legs, so excuse me while I bend down very sorely to get this sheeter. As you can imagine, we have not been doing a whole lot of personal training in the last uh, few years. But also, she got into more of a regimen with a, with a friend of ours, actually. Um, and she's just noticed a huge difference in her ability to uh, have energy through the day, especially since we're on our feet here. Uh, and the nature of our work, too, is such that uh, it's repetitively standing. So the nice thing about just in general being active and being fit is that you can sort of counterbalance the effects of, say, standing on your feet uh, all day long. Um, and so I mentioned this before, I'm sure, we would like to be able to be doing this for a long period of time, and I don't want to get to the point that my body fails me uh, prematurely because I'm not taking care of it. So um, we get plenty of activity in the bakery. Um, in fact, when Amanda started training, uh, the, the gal that's uh, working with us, uh, she was kind of surprised at Amanda's ability to you know, lift substantial amounts of weight uh, for her size and for, for her stated level of, you know, working out. Uh, but we do carry 50 pound bags of flour around here all the time. And there are elements of this work that, that are pretty physical. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, that it's well-rounded either. Uh, it's, it can be repetitive. And so at the end of the day, uh, it's pretty common for your lower back to to feel achy, for your joints to feel achy. Um, stretching, doing type yoga type exercises really helps with that. Uh, but we wanna sort of take it to the next level as well and have a baseline fitness level that can sustain what we're doing to our bodies in here. Uh, so without further ado, let's get this started. I've got my phase converter on so that this machine runs. That's that hum that you might hear uh, slightly in the background. Uh, I've got basically my station set up. I like, oh, I'm missing one object. I use a pizza wheel and the last objects to put on the sheeter are these top scrapers. They just clip in pretty easily. You saw that those bottom scrapers were a little bit challenging to put in. Um, these are the things that basically need to be cleaned on a daily basis because the, the butter and the dough as it goes through, small amounts of it get trapped in these scra scraper blades. So if you don't clean those, you'll have a pretty nasty uh, sheeter very quickly. So we take these off on a daily basis and clean them and then pop them back in. All right, so I've got cold dough I've got room temperature butter. That's a very important uh, first step to all of this. Uh, this dough has already been bulk fermented, uh, stretched out to this dough sheet, and then put in the cool fridge. Uh, the top, even though we do everything to protect its moisture content, these couche cloths are designed for that. They're they come from France, actually. Uh, we have not found a more local source of them. Uh, the trap, trap the humidity of the dough uh, so that the dough doesn't uh, keep drying out. The way that refrigerators and walk-in coolers are designed is they suck the moisture out of the air as a means of cooling down the space. And once all the moisture is out of the ambient air, well, the moisture is going to come out of what, what's next is your, your dough. We actually have humidifiers in ours, although you can combat the lack of humidity with couche cloths. And so croissant dough in particular, I don't want it drying out. And so we'll use that even though we have humidifiers in there. And we're still going to have to make some adjustments in our new space where we won't have humidifiers 
in our walk-in cooler. Uh, we will in our, in our proofing chamber, of course. Um, that's a little bit of a different story. So I'm gonna set that one back here to load back up. Now, I've got essentially three very moist sides of dough, moist, they're, they're not wet to the touch or anything, uh, but, they're, but there is one side, the side that was on the very top of the sandwich that I had there. It was basically dough sheet, uh, couche cloth, dough sheet, couche cloth. That side that was most exposed to the air is the driest by far. Now, when dealing with this butter, I learned that it was important that that side be oriented in a particular way, facing up. Um, and, and that's actually quite consistent with a lot of machinery in general in the bakery. The dough divider uh, also likes uh, that there be more moisture on the bottom and less moisture on the top. Like you'll flour the top of the, the things that you're dividing, but not the bottom. Uh, so I, I thought that that was interesting. Now, this butter sheet has also changed since my last video. This is six full pounds of butter. Whereas the last time you saw me laminating, it was four and a half. Uh, it's one of the one of the interesting benefits of this new butter is that since it's so much stiffer and has less moisture, the dough doesn't rip apart at the last bit of lamination uh, nearly as easily. I mean, we haven't found the max amount of butter that we could put in the croissants yet, whereas before we were quite literally at max. If you go back almost a year to my first video, sourdough croissants start to finish, uh, you'll notice that in that video, I had tried to put in a half pound more of butter during the lamination, and at the very end, the dough uh, ripped apart. Uh, and I, I, well, it didn't quite rip apart, but it started to uh, separate and I had to do some crazy mitigation similar to the last video uh, with this new butter. So you've seen two lamination videos that were very experimental and this one I hope is a little bit more dialed. But essentially with that 82 we had reached the max amount of butter that we could incorporate in a pastry. Uh, and now that we're at 83 we were able to bump that up to higher levels which is quite nice for a number of reasons. Uh, more butter means that the, the croissant itself is going to obviously taste more buttery. But more butter also means that the croissant will hold up over time a little bit better. So uh, my measure is that croissants that we bake late on Friday night, I typically like to enjoy on Sunday. Uh, and I always have a croissant on Sunday to see how a lot of our customers might enjoy them as well. Because I imagine if you go to a farmer's market on Saturday, if you actually have the wherewith, the, the mental strength to not consume the croissant while you're still walking around, that you might wait until the next morning to eat it. So I want to make sure that the croissants we make are good that, that distance from the time that they're baked. And butter is, the more butter, the, the better in that regard. Just the croissant I enjoyed last Sunday uh, was just tasted way more fresh than, than the croissants that we were making before. So I've got my driest side up, I've got the butter, and then I've got the other side. And I'm gonna just barely close the rollers here. So they're almost to the, um, to the widest level. That's a good start. Basically all I'm doing is kind of smoothing it out uh, and, and kind of solidifying the sandwich that I just formed. Uh, one thing that I've done in the last few weeks 
the first adjustments that I made from shattering butter to where we're at now uh, had to do with uh, just more gentle lamination. These belts don't actually move at the same rate. Um, when you go in, in one direction, it's like pulling the dough apart. And in the other direction, it's kind of pushing the dough back together. And so what I've started to do is basically only bring the rollers down and contract the dough in the direction where the, the sheeter is actually kind of pressing the dough together, uh, which is orienting to my right. Um, as a result, if any of the butter is separating, then the, the machine is actively helping me by, by squeezing it back together while also still rolling it thinner. Uh, and so that's, that's been helpful. In the previous iteration of butter, since it had a higher moisture content, it was also more pliable. Uh, and this, this micro adjustment was less necessary. Uh, so before I used to take it down to 20 millimeters and that was my rotation. But now that I have more butter in the dough, the dough can't go down that far and still rotate and be, because really what I'm trying to do right now is get it to the width of the belt before I rotate it and stretch it the other way. So I found a new measurement that's working out a little bit better for me. Of course I say that and this first batch is just a little less narrow than I'd like it to be. So I'm going to take it one more pass through and just inch it down. So we're going to go to literally a millimeter more. You can see that now we're pretty close to the width of the belt. Now I'm fully opening again. And now I'm taking it down by a measure of six millimeters, uh, which is against this 30 millimeter wheel. It's, you could consider that fairly severe. Opening it back up. And now I'm going to take it all the way down to the final measure for this first lock in turn. Just straightening it out a little. It's all the way down to eight millimeters for us. Along the way, I'm going to cut along the line where the butter begins. Fold that so that I can fit. And now address this side. So at the edges, I've got a clear line. I can outline it for you. That's, that's where the butter is. If you look really closely at the dough, you can, you can see that it's basically stiffer and smoother going to that line. And then all of a sudden the dough puffs up a little bit. And that's how I know that that's where my butter ends and the dough begins. And so what I'm going to do is cut along that line and try to stay straight. And then actually I have this weird corner over here. It's kind of a weird shape today. So do that.
fold this over. So it wasn't just the adjustment. So I'm doing the same thing on these edges. I'm basically trimming out what's just dough and doesn't have butter on it. And so these are scraps. Uh, if you're in a lamination competition, you'd probably just discard those scraps. Although those are just perfectly good sourdough croissant dough. Um, so in reality, I can create a, as thin of a layer as I can with these in here, and they're just going to merge as a part of that layer of dough. And so I'm going to stretch them out fairly thin. in strips. And then just fold them into the, the next layer. So they'll basically become that layer of, of dough. I've noticed really no significant difference in the final pastry aside from not having to throw this perfectly good dough away which I think is worth it. So we do a book fold to start. And one of the adjustments that I've made recently is a slight overcorrection in this fold. So I it, like my pinky width essentially over the fold. And the reason being is the first thing I'm doing is taking this through the sheeter at full width. And so now I have a pretty even set here. Uh, it, it evened out on this side of the sheeter so that it's straight. You can see that that overcorrection is no longer there. Now I'm going to go straight into the second fold. That's just the way that we do things around here. I took it all the way down to my turn point, which is 20 millimeters. You can see that it's close to the full width of the dough. At this point, last time my dough was already beginning to shatter on me quite a bit. We had gaps in some cases that were a couple inches big uh, that I had to try to figure out how to correct. We, I think we only had one sheet out of 10 or so you see this is still a very smooth, uh, smooth layer of dough and, and probably as I go today it will get better and better. I, I find that my first one is usually weaker than my tenth one for the day. I don't know why. Down to 15. And down to 10. Trim up the edge just a little. So on this first one, you can see barely some spots in this in this uh, batch that are that uh, that have some micro tears that are in the butter that are you know like less than a centimeter uh, and and not full length or anything. There's just some some very small fractures, uh, uh, quite acceptable uh, at the end of the day. Uh, if we're using the same grading scale uh, that I was using before, there's, it's hard to give this anything but like a B plus. Um, dimpling it twice, which lets me know that I have gone through two turns. And then covering it with a couche cloth 
and then I'm going to put it back in the cool room. And I get to go straight into my next batch now. The other major adjustment that we made was in the dough itself. Uh, so you have a stiffer butter with less moisture content. And what we were noticing was that the dough itself on the sheeter was stretching at a very different rate than the butter was. Uh, and half the reason for our shattered butter uh, was that, where basically the dough was pulling out and, and thinning out um, at an easier rate than the butter was, um, which kind of left the butter behind and left it to shatter. So the adjustment we made to our croissant dough was we actually dropped the hydration level uh, of our croissant dough by a few percentage points. So we created a stiffer overall croissant dough. And in doing so, it more matched the texture of the, um, of the butter. And once we did that, we immediately noticed a huge improvement to the overall process again, uh, where it felt a lot more like our previous uh, dough did. So I'm going to take this one through a little bit faster. What's been kind of fun lately is we've been noticing so many more nuances. Um, and so uh, I think it just shows that we've been doing this for a while. Uh, but, but being able to sort of make those adjustments uh, is a little bit of a point of pride because uh, I don't think that we've always been in a position where, where we've felt confident enough to look at a problem and solve it quite rapidly. Because to, to have a problem set like we did and to solve it in a matter of a couple weeks, it, it takes uh, really having a strong observation of what you're working with on a daily basis, um, studying it really, uh, and, and understanding uh, all the variables surrounding it. So you can see that this top layer was the dry one. You can see that by its texture. You can see the difference here and here. And so in addition to it running through the sheeter better this way, um, it also is better for the dough itself because uh, dough that's dried out a little bit that is now in the middle of your block is going to rehydrate naturally. This, uh, this dough is far from its completion point. Uh, we've got hours before it's going to be on the table rolled out into pastries, all of which during, during which that entire process uh, we're going to be, it's going to be rehydrating. So th this this layer will look like this layer uh, by that point. Um, and, and then of course there's more time after that. But you can see I'm doing the same thing now. I'm down to uh, the eight millimeters and into my book fold. Uh, and I'm getting probably just purely because it's already my second one of the day, uh, stronger results. Trimming up the edges. And there's less edges to trim on this one. 
I'm again going to take these scraps and stretch them to form another layer. Because all this is is croissant dough. It doesn't actually have butter in it. That's why I cut it out. I, uh, so the, all the trimmings happen at the butter line. And we'll look again in more detail on one of the other blocks to uh, identify how you can find that, that spot in the block to cut. Oftentimes I'll, I'll judge my result based on how much scrap I have because it just went through the, the sheeter a lot smoother. And I think I had another several inches of scrap uh, before. So going through that over correction and on this one so far, I mean, there's no sign of fracture. It's perfectly smooth. Uh, so from a lock-in perspective, it's definitely, definitely in the range of giving myself that rare A. I, I don't often do that, uh, to be honest. So that's the full full opening. Now we're going to drop all the way down to the level that I need so that I stretch this block of butter to the full width of the roller. And the main difference between this and what, what I was producing when I first got this butter was there are more areas in those 24 layers where you could see that the butter had a crack in it. Um, it in the big scheme of things probably made very little difference because once you get to 72 maybe I had a layer or two in there or three or four even that were imperfect for a bunch of perfect layers and and sort of the the balance still yields a beautiful honeycomb uh, pattern in the croissant and I think that's an important point to note uh, if your butter is actually remaining at the right temperature through the process and it's not rendering out or melting out, uh, you're going to get a nice result at the end because essentially the butter forms a separation between the, the layers of dough. I'm going to save this so that we can compare it to three folds in a little while. Uh, the butter is forming a separation between the, the two layers of dough and you're essentially hoping to guard that separation all the way until the bake. So another benefit of the higher fat content butter is it stands up to heat more. So in our case, we're doing a extended final proof that spans an entire shift. Uh, and at like a, at a high temperature of 80 some degrees, well, the butter needs to not melt away or melt into the dough during that phase. And I'm confident now in hindsight that uh, our previous butter was at least in part melting into the dough uh, in the past. It, it's certainly not fully because we're also getting a nice honeycomb pattern, but that butter had a much lower melt point in general. Uh, so all of the rules that I had before for laminations were like your dough, your butter must be between 60 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's true if you're using that particular butter, I learned, because it wasn't enough to just have the butter between those temperature ranges to avoid shattering. If you're dealing with a stiffer butter like this, you're, you're also going to have to essentially match the stiffness of it more closely with your dough, uh, which we did, uh, and then be more gentle through the lamination process, meaning watch how you're stretching it. Um, and in, in my case, sort of the common themes are a fast, uh, downward action of 
of rolling it out. So we're, we're not going like millimeter by millimeter, but rather uh, we're, we're taking it down uh, between five and 10 millimeters at a time. Uh, so right now, like the full opening here is 30. I'm going to 28 to start. And that's really just to bring the sandwich together. Uh, make sure that if any of the dough was uneven, that it's sort of evened out. And I also get to kind of gauge what's stretching and what's not. Uh, it gives me a good set of eyes on it. I open it back up to 30 and then I bring it down to 23, which is my rotation point. A little narrow again. No, it's not. At least not in the back. Opening up to 30. I'm going from 23 all the way to 15 now. And then I'm going all the way down to eight. So that sort of fast uh, progression downward, we found to be valuable and important uh, when, when doing this process. Whereas with the other butter, I suppose, suppose you could say that the other butter was more forgiving. Uh, and, and so almost as a matter of advice to somebody who's newer uh, trying croissant dough, if you live in the US, you're going to have a harder time finding 83% butter to begin with. Uh, if, if you're doing this for, for production purposes, like say you're you know, trying to uh, incorporate uh, croissants, sourdough croissants in particular, into your lineup, um, you're going to have an even harder time finding the 83% butter, in my experience, uh, because especially if you're still a cottage baker, uh, we didn't have access to this ingredient uh, really from this space. Uh, the reason that we now do is that we have a commercial address in our new location. And so we've already begun to accept, since we have the grocery store next door, if you don't know about that, you can check out a video on that in our feed. It's called uh, Main Street Harvest, but that's, uh, that's a commercial location that we have that we're operating already. And so we're able to accept deliveries from food distributors, which traditionally don't deliver commercially. Um, or residentially, I mean. Uh, so they come in a bigger truck, and so we accept deliveries there. We throw those ingredients in our backstock fridges there and then come grab them and bring them over here. Uh, prior to having that commercial location, we really were limited to what we could buy at our local food distribution uh, shops. Uh, so I think it was part of the reason why we also were eager to source very local for a lot of our ingredients originally uh, because our local flour mill did not have those kind of rules where they're not going to deliver here. You know, we put in a nice order for them. We're one of their larger customers. And so of course they're going to deliver here, but uh, butter is not something that we in our area can get locally um, at this caliber, at least. Um, so that's, this is something that we're sourcing from Wisconsin now. Uh, and the dairy that produces it is, uh, well, they're, they're large enough to, to feed a food distributor, uh, but they're still, this butter is, is still like a small division uh, in their, their really nice operation. Uh, they're just generally a smaller batch production than the butter that we were getting before, uh, which was, I think, a pretty giant conglomerate of some kind. Um, because it said a, a name of a farm, but if you look up that farm name, you don't actually find a, 
you certainly don't find a small little farm somewhere out there. Um, and, and so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is we have access to it now, uh, but if I had to do it all over again and if I had access to this butter right away, I might, I might suggest starting with a more pliable butter to begin with um, to just avoid the frustration uh, of having all the variables all at once because at the end of the day, you're still seeing a part of a pretty dialed process. We know our temperatures really well. We know our fermentation timings really well. And so butter became a single variable that we had to adjust recently. But to be dealing with shattering butter and then on top of it, not really having the fundamental understandings of temperature and time, you could create a situation for yourself where you don't even know where to begin to correct the process. So, you know, any good scientist is not going to have too many variables that they're testing all at once. In fact, it's better to isolate to as few things that you're changing uh, so that you so that you kind of know where to correct. Um, so, so it, I guess what I'm saying is it's okay to take your process incrementally. Um, you don't have to have every, everything you want right away. Um, in fact, I think it's sometimes stronger to build up to things. So uh, this is a sourdough croissant dough made of whole grain, locally sourced heritage grain flour blends. Uh, made with a really high uh, quality butter with a high um, butter fat content uh, and then varied into many different uh, iterations or variations on the table. But all of that didn't happen overnight. You're watching something that, um, that is years in the making now and all of those various points that I just mentioned happened over phases. So if you want to do it, if you want to do it right, I think right, the way that I'm defining right here is, is having a really firm understanding of your dough. Um, then the way that you do that, I think, is to go in uh, steps. So start with, start with uh, easier flour sets. Um, you know, white flour is certainly more forgiving to work with uh, than, than whole grain flour. And so in perfecting your croissants, we also started with white flour. Uh, more pliable butter now in hindsight I would say I mean it's a trade-off it's easier to laminate with but it is harder to deal with temperature wise I'm sort of thankful for all of that time because we are more sensitive to temperature than we maybe otherwise would have been had we started using this butter right away um, so but I think the underlying point too is don't be afraid of making adjustments and for lack of a better way of putting this, pursuing your, your dreams uh, and, and have those dreams. Uh, I think that that applies beyond just a croissant dough and baking, but what's, what's next? Like how do, you, how do you keep leveling up? There's a uh, really neat passage in this book that is simply entitled Bread by Jeffrey Hamelman. Uh, it's one of the first bread books I was, I was actually given this bread book by the founder of Proof uh, in, during the time that uh, I was with him prior to uh, him moving away, which was a couple weeks. And uh, 
in addition to having you know formulas and whatever in it, uh, he has these little blurbs, like these little wisdom blurbs. And this is an older gentleman. I've had the pleasure of actually taking a class from him and baking with him. Uh, he's had a lifetime of experience in bread. But he wrote this passage about the baker's hands. And uh, basically in the passage, he talks about the work of a baker being, uh, being such that you are seeking that perfect loaf every day, secretly hoping, hoping that you never quite achieve it because what would you do then if you actually did achieve that perfect loaf? And I think that with, with bread in particular, but probably most things in life, uh, perfection can be a little bit elusive. Uh, and, and perhaps that's one of the, one of the things that keeps you going, uh, is that there's always something to improve. Uh, I think it's perhaps one of the reasons why I'm baffled when when I notice that uh, people in business begin to cut corners just for a buck. Um, I guess I, I, I have a hard time with that because if I make an extra dollar and I'm already meeting my financial needs, hopefully at least, um, what's that extra dollar to me if the core thing that I'm working on has gotten worse as a result. Uh, so see, in our case here, we got what we believe to be a better butter. And we, as a result of getting that better butter, we were able to put more butter into our bread. We haven't changed the price of our bread, um, mainly because over time we've gotten more efficient too. So our margins have gotten better. Uh, and I don't think that as a business, it should be one dimensional where I get better at what I do and thus I'm the only one rewarded by getting better. Um, if I do get better at what I do, if I get faster or more efficient, yes, I'll, I'll make a little bit more and I'm completely okay with that. Although I think along the way, if I do get substantially better at what I do, more efficient, then perhaps I ought to reinvest as well and pass some of that benefit and improvement onto my customer. Uh, I think it goes both ways. So we have gotten substantially better at what we do over the years. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much time we had to spend doing this by hand in the past. Uh, and so, now that we have better tools and better processes, uh, you know, croissants have become more profitable for us, but along with them being more profitable, they also need to be better for our customer, uh, not worse. And I, I guess like it just annoys me that that's actually the opposite of what I see going on in the world where people start off better get more efficient and then things get worse and worse and worse. Ingredients get cheaper and cheaper and it becomes more about just pure numbers in a bank account um, that are virtual in nature. Uh, I'm not saying money's not important, I think it's quite, um, but it's the whole of, of life that's important and, and the actual product for me is still much more important than the return at the end of the day. And that, that's because before there was a return, uh, there was the product. Uh, and, and I swear to you that I don't think we made a penny in profit for quite a while on, on croissants. I'm pretty confident that if you do the math on year one of sourdough croissants, there was not a whole lot of profitability, but there was a whole lot of sacrifice uh, to get it right. So I want to tell an interesting story of something that happened recently. Last week was 
an odd week for us. Uh, odd, I guess it's kind of our new normal to face quite a few challenges, sometimes all at once. But we certainly had a week that was for the record books of challenges. I had just recently come back from, uh, from a medical trip with uh, my daughter Kira, who as some of you know from previous videos, has a rare genetic condition called uh, Friedrich's ataxia. We have now enrolled her into a clinical trial and she's seeing a doctor all the way in Philadelphia. So we went out there to enroll her, her and I, and uh, Amanda was holding down the fort here. Pretty awesome week actually uh, while I was gone. Uh, the whole team did a great job. Uh, then I got back and it's almost like I brought the storm with me. Uh, on, on Monday, we learned of a potential uh, $20,000 um, electrical situation at the new uh, facility. Uh, on Tuesday, we learned of a potential uh, $40,000 plumbing problem at the new facility. So by Tuesday, I was facing what could have been $60,000 of new expenses. Um, on Wednesday, I was able to successfully resolve some of those problems and dwindle what looked like $60,000 of expenses down to what we hope will be around seven or eight uh, thousand. So quite the reduction, um, fairly good Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday, we were set to get an entire pallet of flour delivered from our local mill and we received a phone call saying that unfortunately the delivery was not going to happen that day um, and that they had experienced a lot of issues recently. Uh, they weren't quite sure when, when the flower was going to arrive. Uh, also on Thursday, two of my solenoid valves went out on the deck oven. Those are the electronic valves that allow steam to pass through. So you hit a button, the valve opens, steam passes through into the oven chamber. So two of those went out. Um, so all of those four problems were pretty much problems that only I could face on the team. Uh, we don't have a trained oven mechanic on staff that knows how to replace solenoid valves, although I have replaced them. Um, we don't have any other team members uh, on staff that, uh, that are qualified to handle a $60,000 construction problem. Um, and there's no one else to deal with a problem with our core ingredient flour. We were literally set to run out of flour in five days time uh, once we got that phone call. Um, meanwhile, because we recently did have to trim our, our staff and cut some of our costs, I am very much full-time in the bakery. And as you can imagine, facing some of these challenges while also baking uh, is uh, a lot. So going through that week and I, I resolved the solenoid issue. So that was interesting. Uh, I had gotten an overnight order from my oven manufacturer for solenoid valves and they came in. So I had them by Thursday. I actually ordered them on Wednesday when we first noticed the problem. Um, uh, I was really pleased that they had come in. I was getting ready to, uh, put them in on Friday morning so that we weren't down two decks of our oven without steam. And so I go to, uh, to replace them. One of the decks had already had solenoid valves replaced and there's two of those per deck. Uh, and in between each of the valves is a pipe fitting. Well, because those had been replaced before that pipe fitting had been un 
done before and it was stripped so I couldn't get the pipe fitting off. Um, and as a result, the pipe fitting was trapped onto the old solenoid valve that I was replacing. And you might think, well, so what? Just go to your local hardware store and get a pipe fitting. Uh, every time I get pipe fittings of any kind for any kind of plumbing project, I'm shocked at the wide range of pipe fittings that are available. So I ran to one hardware store and uh, they didn't have the right, so they had the right size, but it wasn't tapered at the end, so it wasn't actually fitting. I, I, brought, I brought the new solenoid valves with me so I could actually test it. Uh, I ran, and actually meanwhile, um, I had told Cecily, who's baking over here, um, I told her that, hey, this should be done. I had actually already replaced one deck and I was on the second deck by the time I, you know, encountered the stripped pipe fitting. So she had started scoring loaves of bread. Um, and so we had like 80 loaves of bread scored ready to load the oven, but no ovens to load them into. Um, because once the plumbing was taken apart, even though I had two perfectly good decks, all the plumbing was taken apart. And so I couldn't, you couldn't use steam on deck three or deck four without flooding the whole place. The plumbing had to be turned off to the ovens. So I'm kind of in a flurry trying to find the right pipe fittings. And I had to go to three places before I found one that, that worked. I come back and in a hurry, I'm putting that together. And then there's another T fitting at the end. And I had to also take it apart from the old solenoid valve. I took it out to my, um, to, I, I don't, I'm not a contractor. So, you know, that thing that's on the table, the uh, vice grip, uh, I took it out to my vice grip and I, you know, attached it and then I start trying to undo it. But I'm in a hurry and I'm stressed and I'm not, you know, working carefully. And I accidentally bend the uh, T fitting. So now I'm all over again, scrambling to the hardware store to find the T fitting. That one turned out to be a four hour journey um, of going from hardware store to hardware store. I even went to plumbing supply stores. I could not find this T fitting and it's a really tight uh, plumbing setup in the oven. There's just no way to like do a bigger fitting. I needed that, that exact piece. And for those of you in the U S uh, if you've ever encountered ACE hardware, their like slogan is ACE is the place. What's interesting is I didn't go to ACE hardware because it's the smallest of hardware stores and my mental assumption was a bigger hardware store would have better selection. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, it's interesting that I thought that. Um, and I learned that actually the local Ace Hardware is the place because it turned out after five hours and reaching out to the community, I found it at Ace Hardware. We were quite stressed that day because uh, we had scored all that bread and Amanda made the call to bring the scored bread into our walk-in cooler so that it wouldn't just continue to proof. And what's interesting is four hours later, all that bread came out and still all had beautiful ears to it. We were, I was shocked. We learned something that day that you can actually pre-score bread and put it in the walk-in and it won't really degrade in performance. Whereas I thought for sure all those loaves would be flat after they left their forms. And so anyway, uh, that was one interesting uh, result of that day. Uh, the flour situation, which happened the day before the oven upgrade, well, it didn't resolve that day because here we were in a situation where we did not know when our flour delivery was coming. Uh, we were told this quite uncertain. The, uh, the main miller was out and it wasn't clear when he was coming back. Um, 
So we had to place an order for flour um, from our from our regional mill, and we got some roller milled um, whole grain organic flour that was the closest to our base flour that we could get rushed here. Uh, I learned a lot about steel milling, and so I kind of want to. I want to tell that story uh, as well. Uh, at this point, you can go back into our feed and learn all about the stone mill that we source much of our flour from locally. You can actually see the mill in action. Uh, we did an entire series on, on the mill. Uh, well, stone milling is the most traditional way of milling uh, flour. It's the way that we've been milling flour for thousands of years. Uh, steel milling is something that came about uh, during the Industrial Revolution, um, and it's actually the way in which you produce white flour. Although now I know uh, something that I didn't quite know before, and that's that there's multiple types of steel mills. I guess I did know this in part. I'll sort of backtrack. A few years ago, I went to a grain gathering in northern Washington, and I got to tour uh, a mill by the name of Cairn Springs, which is a hybrid mill. They uh, have a steel milling component and a stone milling component. And I was struck by how different the mill setup was from our local one. And it was then that I thought, wow, it seems like all mills are slightly different from one another. Uh, and I think that that's quite true, that most flour mills uh, vary from one another in one way or another. But when it comes to steel milling, now I know that there are two main uh, ways to to mill by steel. The way that I observed in northern Washington uh, was a form of uh, short form steel milling where uh, the wheat is milled as a whole uh, through the st steel mill and then sifted down to whatever refinement level you want. And it, another name for it now that I know is that that's a whole wheat uh, steel mill. Uh, so when steel mills will, when I would say smaller format steel mills produce whole wheat flour, that's how they do it. Um, then there's a, another form of milling, of steel roller milling uh, that's involved in actually producing white flour where it's a long form mill and in that mill, everything is separated out from the wheat berry other than the endosperm, which is what white flour is, uh, just the starchy endosperm. If you want to make that into a whole grain flour afterwards, what the millers do is they reinsert the, the stuff that came out during the process back in, in part or whole to create whole wheat or whole grain. And in that case, you could have a situation where perhaps it's not coming from the same batches of flour anymore. It's sort of you know, put back together. Um, so when I was selecting our organic flour that was supposed to substitute for our stone milled flour, I was asking all those questions. And it turned out that I had the option to get um, whole grain flour that originated from that long form mill and then was kind of put back together, or I had the option of getting whole grain flour that was uh, made on the short form mill and so it was whole wheat that was sifted down so that the bigger particles in the wheat were removed, the bigger particles of bran and germ. Well, you can probably imagine that we opted for the short form mill uh, because it's pretty much exactly like the stone mill that we use, except for a couple key differences. So in order for wheat to go through that steel mill, the millers will temper the wheat beforehand. Uh, so tempering means they'll actually uh, 
they'll put some, some amount of water uh, with it to soften it and, and then it goes through the mill. Uh, well, that changes the moisture content in the resulting flour uh, and makes the moisture content higher. So basically one of the variances between steel milling and stone milling is that the moisture content in steel milling ends up higher. Uh, so when we got this uh, flour delivered, the first thing we did was look to cut the hydration. Um, and I was really pleased because our entire mixing process, which you can see in previous videos, uh, like the bassinage video is a great one, um, because we reserve water uh, to put back into the mix at the very end, we do that for dough development, but it also allows you to adjust the hydration levels by feel. And so we were able to basically on the first day uh, use that bassinage to adjust hydration down appropriately record it and almost immediately get the same exact results that we get in our local sourdough. Uh, the resulting loaf, which is of uh, Pacific Northwest grown wheat, uh, is pretty close in taste and texture uh, to, our, to our local sourdough. So I was quite pleased with that, but I think that having that bassinage technique was pivotal to doing that. Anyway, uh, so that was Monday, and uh, we thought we might have to change our whole menu to this organic wheat for a little while. But I got a call late Monday from our local mill saying they've rallied together, and uh, our entire order of flour is arriving tomorrow. Uh, so now we had sort of the opposite problem of oversupply. Now we have a pallet of organic flour and a pallet of local flour. And so we're running both on the menu now. We have an organic sourdough and we have a local sourdough and we're getting it done. Uh, but the story doesn't quite end there. The local flour was not milled by the same individual that normally mills our flour. And so we go to bake with it and we're just kind of noticing some changes. Um, And most particularly, we noticed a change in the color of the flower itself. Um, it's lighter in color than our typical proof blend flower is. And uh, we had the organic flower, which was sifted to a similar level side by side. And we we're noticing the organic flower looked a lot more like our previous proof blend flower did. And now the proof blend flour looked lighter and had smaller specks of bran and uh, germ, almost more akin to the other local flour that we use, the white Sonora, which has a lesser whole grain content. Well, this was kind of troubling to us. We didn't notice any performance differences. We've baked with the uh, other flour before in our artisan loaves. They actually become a little bit bigger by volume. Um, but that wasn't happening. It was just a color difference. Uh, so I called the mill up and tried to figure out what was going on. Uh, and it turns out we weren't crazy. It was a little bit different. Uh, what, what they ended up saying was that basically the, the millers that came in to, uh, cover for the, the main miller that was out, they'd used a different sifting screen, uh, a finer sifting screen. And so the, the, the flower was literally a lighter color. And you can actually see it here. Um, so we're still on this. So, whoops. Here's one local blend. And this is our proof blend. And it is a little bit darker, but barely. And yet 
historically, this flower is significantly darker than this flower. Um, so another interesting learning lesson, the amount of whole grain in that flower is the same uh, as it was before, although the composition is slightly different because it's been sifted more finely. So there's less, there's less larger particles of bran and germ in it. Uh, performs pretty, sim pretty similar though. Uh, I guess moral of that story is regular involvement in your production environment as an owner of a business uh, is important so that you can have the eyes for nuance because things in your supply chain do change over time. You might change your butter in your croissant dough. You have to know enough to know what the heck is going on and why you would and why you wouldn't. Uh, your flour might change invariably uh, due to the seasons, due to the crop, but it also might change due to a human mistake. Uh, and it's extremely subtle. I think a lot of people wouldn't have caught it. Uh, but, but because we are fairly involved around here, uh, you know, those are the things that we're looking out for. We're, we are sticklers for trying to do the best that we can to produce the highest quality bread uh, possible. And that means having an understanding of all of these like little nuances. Uh, you have to know enough about milling and about grains, I think. Uh, you have to know enough about butter and its properties. Uh, I mean, I know more now than I did a couple weeks ago. And to be honest, I, I really had thought that I had learned much of what there is to know about lamination and it turns out that I hadn't uh, because just by switching the butter out really it threw me for a loop for a couple weeks uh, but it turns out that you also as a baker have to have a baseline understanding of plumbing and pipe fittings and uh, and if you start building a commercial location all kinds of construction uh, dynamics as well. So uh, I'm incredibly appreciative to all the people in my life that have uh, rounded out some of that information over time. Uh, I think it's a, just a appropriate moment to talk about how thankful I am for my dad as an example. Um, over the last few years, but really over the course of my life, I've been watching him build things um, and, uh, you know, remodel things. And um, together he and I designed, conceptualized, and then he pretty much single-handedly built this bakery. Uh, and that happened over the course of a few years. Perhaps it's a sad thing. I mean, it is a sad thing that we had to sort of leave it so abruptly. Uh, our new addition to the bakery was pretty much finished uh, only months before we were served a demand letter saying, hey, you have to leave this place. But the, the, the silver lining is that over the course of the last few years, I had to go through construction permitting and I had to deal with the same city. I had to go through framing and electrical and plumbing. I had to go through inspections. We cut concrete in here that was uneven before, which we're doing right now again um, in our, for, for different purposes in our new location. We put in sinks, we put in ovens, we serviced ovens. We, we did all of this learning before we went commercial. The amount of challenges that we faced in our commercial construction project without that baseline few years that led up to it, I think, I don't know. I, I think that 
the anxiety levels that we've been feeling recently have been at all time highs. And I guess I just can't imagine going through it all without having the understanding that we've accumulated, which I imagine most people that are building out their first commercial locations do not have simply because they didn't spend years, you know, trying to do this in a garage. So, you know, I mean, I guess that's my big response to all the critics. Like, how could you do this in a residential garage or why would you build all this is I think things happen for a reason in life and we wouldn't be building the bakery that we're building right now and building the future that we're building right now if not for this foundation. Uh, not only would we not be economically viable uh, to do so, uh, we'd be taking on ridiculously higher levels of debt against no earnings, uh, which is completely nonsense to me. The idea of, of building a half a million dollar facility and not having any revenue to support it and just rolling the dice, hoping that it happens for you. You know, revenue doesn't grow overnight. Uh, we just started that new local grocery uh, chain and you know, we're going into our first season of summer and I've got a team member that's been working with Proof for three years who's managing that store and uh, essentially in charge of its, its growth and future. And you know, she's dealing with kind of the downward trend of the first summer and her only experience has been watching Proof over the first last few years. Well, you know, we're, we're going into our I think fifth summer this year. Um, so we're closing out four years. We started in the summer. So yeah, this will be our, our fifth summer. Well, summer's gotten a lot more stable for proof over time. We've earned that. We've, we've earned a larger following. We've earned more customers. Uh, that first summer was a really ridiculous downward turn. So I'm now getting to kind of be the, the mentor encourager on that end, um, you know, letting uh letting our team member know hey like it's gonna build over time it's gonna take time and we're gonna support it all the way uh that's the local grocery store but i can't imagine having the debt burden that we carry right now or a greater debt burden because no revenue to support construction right imagine we're still paying for a lot we we're not taking we're not starting from scratch. We already have a bakery. And so a lot of our bakery is moving with us. Uh, all of our processes, all of our customers, all of our sales channels, they're moving with us. Uh, I really can't imagine doing this all from scratch and taking that big of a gamble. And so that's just furthering kind of my, my overall view that we ought to look at the way in which businesses start if we believe in private entrepreneurship and business development we ought to offer more opportunity for people to get creative um, for people to use resources that they already possess uh, garages for instance i'm not advocating that you should disturb your neighbors or anything like that i i definitely think that there should be some rules in place to protect neighborhoods or whatever, but, but generally we should allow people to innovate and allow people to grow slowly, allow people to grow organically. I think that's when the best things happen. Moving on to the final turn, final fold, whatever you want to call it. Uh, these things have been resting in, in sequence since I've been doing the second fold. So, by the time I get to the last uh, or the 10th block today, it'll at least be a 30, 45 minute delay from the time that it was in its second uh, turn. Do this for a number of reasons. Uh, I think if you just go reading about this, uh, you won't find as much information as you would hope for. Uh, but a lot of people will say that it's for the butter and for its integrity. Uh, in, in my experience, especially this 83% butter, 
it's less about the butter and more about the dough. Uh, yes, cooling down the dough and cooling down the butter helps you get a reset because the friction of the, of the rolling out warms everything up. Uh, but you're doing this so fast on a, on a dough sheet or if you're working on a sheeter that that's not so much a factor. Uh, now, if you go back in my Instagram feed and find a photo of the pasta roller that we used to use, well, that process was a lot rougher on the dough, just more friction, more heat, and the dough did heat up more. And so we couldn't even go two turns before the fridge. We had to go one fold fridge, second fold fridge, third fold fridge. Uh, and that was about keeping, keeping the temperatures in line. However, now it's really more about the fact that, and this is a consistent theme in, in many of the videos, dough has, when you're dealing with dough and you're strengthening it, you're adding tension to it, uh, there, there is a limit to that uh, tensioning that you can do. And so as, as you're rolling out the dough, you're tensioning it severely, and there's only a certain amount that it is able to do before it's too much for it. So by putting it in the fridge, you're also allowing the, the dough to relax again and get some slack back so that it can be stretched out. So uh, I think that that's a more important consideration for taking a pause than any other. Now you'll notice in the other videos that I've done that if my butter's cracking a lot, I just go ahead and go through the third fold because then I'm actually actively warming up the butter and encouraging it to kind of come back together. Uh, but that is a mitigation technique. It's not the, the main way that I would choose to laminate otherwise. And now that, it's interesting because the last, the last segment on lamination that we did, uh, I had to use that mitigation technique, I think on almost every single sheet, save maybe one. And you know, now we're back to our more normal workflow where basically every, every sheet is handled in this manner. Um, and it would only be an outlier that, uh, that we would take three sets in without cooling. So we'll always cool in between the, the second and third uh, if we have our way with it. All three rounds of lamination to give you a comparison. So this is that first book fold and it's quite clear. You can see dough, butter, dough, butter, dough, butter, dough, butter. Uh, by the way, that's that central like beefed up layer and you can see it doesn't vary a whole lot. But by the time you get into the second fold, you, you don't see that extra dough that you folded in. But in here you have eight distinct layers of dough. Now add a trifold, and so there's 24 distinct layers of dough, butter, dough, butter, dough, butter. Add another trifold, and we're up to 72 layers in that, in that third fold. And so you can see how thin each layer is in that, that last uh, set. Again, this butter is stiffer and is less likely to merge together with your dough. But the longer that you let this block go, the more likely uh, the butter is going to start incorporating itself into the dough itself over time. You don't want that. You want to get to a final pastry that has all the layers intact. So uh, really like minimum 30, 45 minutes, let it cool down so that you can roll it out. Absolute maximum would be probably a half a shift. Uh, in our experience, when we've tried to take it overnight, uh, we've noticed a significant degradation in the final pastry where uh, the layers don't separate quite as, quite as well. So it's definitely an upper limit to how far you can take it. Uh, so now I get to basically just go through my 10 sheets and this process goes relatively uh, quickly. The hardest part of lamination is definitely that first part, that first, uh, first set of folds. The lock-in in particular, 
I, I'm under the impression that once you get past that lock-in layer, everything else sort of falls in line as, as, a, as basically a result of how successful your lock-in was. So if you have really perfect first fold, likely you're going to have a pretty perfect second fold and third fold. Um, I'm gonna go into a couple other key considerations for your croissant dough. And again, remember that I'm speaking from the perspective of a sourdough croissant dough. We of course drop the hydration on this as I mentioned uh, to match kind of the texture of the butter. And so again, just pointing out the lack of value in just getting a recipe from me. Um, Certainly it'd be a decent starting point, but you know, you have to think beyond the recipe and look at the process and look at the problem solving aspect of dough development because no two butters, no two flours are exactly alike. And so what we've always sort of done here with, with this content is dive deep into process and problem solving and, and less into to just providing a recipe. Uh, and, and that's in line with the whole idea that, that food ingredients are still varied. An ingredient is not just an ingredient. It, an ingredient is subject to uh, all its various micro conditions. So uh, I think that I've demonstrated that fully in uh, this butter. Uh, and, and it is the same with our flour. You know, we talked about We've talked about changes in flour and how those can impact things. Um, so, but some general guidelines. After you mix your croissant dough, uh, you want to let it bulk ferment at a warm temperature for at least enough time to start seeing activity. Uh, if you don't see any kind of rise before you cool it down, you will really short change yourself at the end because essentially any bulk fermentation time and any rise that happens up front exponentially decreases your final proof. So what you're actually doing uh, when you're bulk fermenting is you're building up your cell colony of new uh, microorganisms that live in a sourdough starter. So when I do a mix, I'm, I'm doing something similar to when I refresh my starter. Consider that when you refresh your starter, you are adding flour and water and mixing it together. Well, when you mix a dough, you're adding flour and water and whatever else is in your dough and mixing it together. And so you're reactivating that process of feeding and so the, the colony of microorganisms is then multiplying into your new dough. And that's what makes the dough fermented, is basically the dough goes from just being raw flour and water to flour and water that is being digested actively by this, these microorganisms, which are multiplying and becoming more abundant in your dough. Well, so you have to make sure they get a feeding and they grow and multiply before you chill your dough. Because by the time you chill your dough, that activity really slows. If you don't get a head start, then basically that climb at the end is very steep. You're waking up all of those microorganisms and you have a tiny colony that's trying to colonize all this dough that you've introduced to it. Uh, so you can have a situation where if you don't do a bulk fermentation time, Basically, you could do a final proof for 12, 13 hours and get nowhere. Uh, and your, your overall results will suffer. So when you're bulk fermenting your dough, you gotta at least see a little bit of rise. Uh, we have varied our bulk fermentation anywhere from, from an hour and a half to three and a half hours. Uh, based on all these other various variables that we're monitoring. Right now, I think we're averaging about two and a half of bulk fermentation. Uh, 
The other influencer is that the longer you bulk ferment, the proofier your dough is and the weaker it is at the sheeter. So it's all kind of a balancing act. But that's also an important aspect of this process that feeds directly into lamination. And we can look at that another time. But once, uh, once you've got that bulk fermentation down, you want to stretch your dough out to whatever the same size that your butter block is stretched out to. For us, we use full sheet trays as our guide, but that's quite a lot of dough. Um, plus, a full sheet tray doesn't fit into a home oven, so if you're working at home, you're going to want to at least cut the process in half. And a half sheet tray of pastry with a half sheet tray of butter, it's going to yield anywhere between 20 and 30 final croissants, which is probably a fairly nice size batch for, for the home. You want to give some away, too. Uh, so I, I don't think you'd make a batch of 10 cookies. Uh, usually people make a, a few dozen. Same here. I, I think same principle applies. At some point, when I really have the stomach for it, we'll do some hand lamination. Uh, I've done it a lot in my, in my life. So, you know, before YouTube, I thought my days of hand laminating dough are over. But at some point, I'm probably going to have to show you guys uh, how to do that. Uh, it is a little bit harder for sure, but the same general principle applies. It's just now that mechanical action of those rollers has to happen with your, with your hands. So even use of a rolling pin becomes, becomes a skill. I'm just barely trimming the ends just so I can get a cleaner set of lines. And this is that last trifold. So. Uh, in the, the first layer, it was a book fold, and the last two layers are trifolds, so it's like folding an envelope in three. I'm dimpling three times, and that tells me that this is done. So the other thing, because of how we're doing this, we can actually go directly into rolling out pastries after this, because number one, two, and three are already resting and preparing it's going to take me another 20 minutes or so to get through the rest. And by that point, it will have been at least a half hour. I'll probably get a sip of water, uh, take a five minute break, and then I can immediately start rolling out pastry on the table. So, you know, the, the goal is staggering. Um, and having kind of the right process time management so that nothing really ever goes idle in the bakery. Uh, the challenge of baking at home, on, on the contrary, is, especially with sourdough, is you have to find ways to build in sourdough into the rest of your life. And whether you're making one loaf or you're making 100 loaves, that 24-hour process doesn't really change. And so there's going to be a lot more pauses when you're only making one thing. I think it can definitely be done if that's your intention. Um, you're never going to be able to get the value that you get from buying from a baker if you value your time in a monetary sense. Uh, because you're going to spend a lot more time making one loaf of bread than, than you are going to spend going and buying one for whatever the cost, really whatever the cost of artisan bread is, uh, will, will be far less than if you just value your time at, at minimum wage. Uh, but I think that those of you who bake at home bake for reasons other than monetary value. Uh, and, and as a fellow baker, I can, I can certainly appreciate those reasons. Uh, I probably, you know, if I didn't have a bakery, I would probably bake most of my own bread uh, after, after having done it. I think that like anything else that you pick up, uh, it's just now a part of our lifestyle. Something that giving up would, it, it would probably take away from, from a lot of the aspects of our life because I think for us, bread is a, serves as a really interesting teacher and also an interesting, um, interesting grounding activity um, in our lives. You know, those of you who are contemplating baking from home if you're trying to bake from home as a means of saving money, you're probably looking at it the wrong way. Uh, 
if you're trying to bake from home as a means of you know, enhancing your lifestyle through learning a new craft, uh, it's probably more along the lines of what you might actually find. We too are still learning how to organize our time and get really everything that we want out of our days. I know that for the last few years as we've been building the bakery, uh, we've been not doing other things. Uh, you know, perhaps not spending as much time with our kids at times, uh, having to sacrifice moments. It's meaningful if there's a purpose behind it. But if you lose that sense of purpose or you lose that sense of intention, then you have to wonder why you're making those sacrifices. Uh, you know, when you have a child like we do with a life-altering, life-shortening uh, disease, that sort of really punches you in the gut. Like, you can't get, you can't get moments back where perhaps, you know, life was a little bit more carefree, where, where the progression of her genetic disease was less evident and where, you know, there's less of a risk of falling on a regular basis. Um, but similarly, we won't be able to get moments like we have now back where aside from treatments, which we are very hopeful for, the 100% uh, disease progression is a loss of an ability to walk and a, and a losing ability to communicate. Um, and you know that doesn't just affect Kira, of course it affects her more than anyone else, but it affects our whole relationship dynamic as well. And so you know, now, more than ever, I feel like that time is far more precious. Uh, and so if I'm spending time working and not spending time with her, it better be for a, a very good set of intentions that need to be more clear because I won't be able to get those moments back uh, in the same way. But you don't have to have a debilitating illness to feel that. The lesson's actually the same. It's the same for all of us. It's just we take time for granted unless we're faced with obstacles that take it away from us. Uh, so. It's, it's definitely probably the lesson that I'm battling more than any other right now because quite honestly, our life has become very full. And, and overall, I think that most people would say that that's a good thing. Uh, life is full and has opportunity and has possibilities. Uh, but with a full life come more responsibilities to manage that that uh, level of fullness uh, and so time becomes even more precious. Uh, thus, I would argue don't just bake to bake, bake with an intention. Uh, don't just work to work, work with an intention. Uh, whatever it is that you do, uh, make sure that there's intention behind it. Uh, because otherwise I think that they're, they're, all of us at some point or another might look back with a sense of regret that, uh, that we weren't living with the right amount of intention and we were wasting precious time.